Barbara. Hi. Let me get myself in here. Wait a minute. I'm just gonna activate the waiting room. Yeah, what do I have to do to get, I've got a picture of you. Do I have to make this bigger? There we go. Uh, and are you Gina? 
Yeah. Yes. Oh, there you are. Thanks, Mia. Oh, there you are. She says so. <laughs> and I just, I would like to um, introduce myself at the beginning, just so people, folks know, and then I'll go to mute and, um, you know, turn off my video. Sure. Not yeah. sure. It looks like you've got a big agenda. I'm not sure I can go all the way till 11. Um, sure. No, we. I. I don't think I could go all the way to eleven either. And I've got FinCom so tomorrow we're, night, so we're, we're mutual there. Now, is there anyone else on yet? I don't. No, think. no, no. I actually enabled the waiting room, so nobody will join until um, I let them in, just because um, that allows us to get organized before we open up the meeting. Got it. Now, are you going to want to meet separately? Now, I know that there's. I looked at the agenda. And I know that there's going to be a draft of the budget tonight. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, the biggest thing is going to be that we're in the middle of uh, negotiations with the Nahant Teachers Association. Right. So, um, you know, once we once we know what salary is, then we'll be able to move forward with the budget. So I think that that's on hold until we get through. February 15th is our next meeting. Yeah. Um, write that down. I, I'd be unrealistic in hoping that we'll be through it after that. Um, As I recall, we've actually had town meetings one year where you had, it was still on. Well, where what? Isn't it true that sometimes it, it keeps going on? I mean, that the, the negotiations. Yeah. It'll be done before we have to propose the budget. I just think it's gonna be done in early March. And I think that our timeline works for that, but I, I can ask Tony when he gets on the meeting. Okay. And then the other thing is, would you like to meet um, Zoom separately. separately with Deborah and me? Or uh, how do you... I think at some point we'd like to meet when our budget, hey Lauren, Lauren's been through this before. Barbara. Hi Lauren. Hi. Barbara. Hi. So, uh, she was she was asking, um, do we typically meet, you know, prior to the presentation of the budget separately? I don't know. This is my first time around. Well, it can be after. It's whenever you want to. There's no. Mm -hmm. There's no set time. It's whatever. We're, hi. Um, it's whatever. We're here just you know, to listen and liaise or however you pronounce that word. <laughs> I was saying the biggest thing that we need to get past is the negotiations, which is still ongoing. Um, but typically the budget is, or proposal is finalized after we know what the teacher salary is gonna be. Is that correct? That's correct. That's really important for us to figure out first, the biggest, biggest variable. Um, so typically speaking, we've just met with um, the FinCom once the preliminary budget or you know, relatively final budget has been kind of devised by Tony and we've reviewed it all. And then we have some kind of realistic numbers to talk about. Um, that's what we've done historically, but you know, up to you. So that would be maybe sometime in before town meeting, but that might be sometime in April. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. Sounds good. I think that's a realistic timeline. Good. Yeah. I think that's what we've done in the past. Yeah. That's good. Great. All right. And Let's the other thing is, to, and think about it for that meeting, if there are any special issues of any sort, let us, you know, all good. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm just going to introduce myself quickly when we start. So let me know. I'll be watching and let me know when you'd like me to, Gina. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Michelle. Hi. Hi. Kevin. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hi. 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 So Beth isn't going to be here today. So as soon as Patty joins, we can get started. And Deborah Warren, who was the other liaison, was trying to get in. And I don't know 
I don't know why she was having trouble because I clicked on the link that Kristen sent us and it worked perfectly. Okay. It, you know, it can always be finicky. I wonder if the waiting room got enabled or anything, Gina. Do you see her in there? I head? did. Yeah, I, I enabled the waiting room, but she's not in the waiting room. So uh, there's a problem on our side, yeah. Okay. I can email her. Let me just get this smaller. Well, I always forget how to get it smaller. Where's the make it smaller thing? I don't know. I'm afraid to touch anything because I'm afraid to disable the world. Yeah, I'm not going to touch anything because if I go to something, it's going to close me out and then it's not going to let me back in. Do you have her email address? I can forward you the, I can forward her the, the link that I have. I copied her. She got sent the same link, okay. but then she just emailed me 10 minutes ago saying she was having trouble getting in. And I emailed her back saying I got in fine. So right. I don't know what's up, but I don't want her. Then I emailed her back saying, well, maybe there's some whatever. But then when uh, I got in, anyway, I just don't want her to be sitting around thinking that there's. That right. Be opening up the waiting room momentarily anyway. So once she logs in, she'll be able to get right into the meeting. Good. All right. Hello. I'm ready. Uh, hi, Patty. I think we're ready to get going because um, that's not coming tonight. So I'm gonna open up the waiting room. And I'm gonna go. Um, good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order the school committee meeting January 25th, 2022 at 701. If we could please uh, start the meeting by rising and saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance yes. to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United, United States, States of America, America. and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. all. Before I get started, uh, we have a special guest with us this evening, uh, Barbara Beatty um, from the Finance Committee, who I'd like to introduce. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for joining. Hi. Um, I just want to let you know, this is my second year um, as a liaison um, to you, although last year I wasn't quite, I think um, John Fulgen was doing a lot more last year. So just to let you know, I was a teacher. I taught kindergarten in the Boston Public Schools. And then I became a teacher educator, college professor, first at Leslie um, in Cambridge, and then finally chair of the education department um, at Wellesley College. And I just retired two years ago, but I'm still involved um, you know, in writing and things like that. And um, very, very interested in education um, policy teachers, all of that. So this is um, very close to my heart. And thank, thank you for all that you're doing. I also want to say how impressed I am with how you've been dealing with COVID, the COVID challenges. I have been following that in your minutes and uh, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, so we have the meeting uh, minutes from January 11th uh, to review the regular meeting minutes. Thank you, Lauren, for taking the minutes. Um, if there's any discussion regarding the minutes or if there's no discussion, if I could take a motion to approve the minutes from January 11th. Make a motion to approve the school committee minutes dated uh, January 11th. Thanks, Ms. Karras. Can I have a second to approve the minutes? I'll second. I think that just goes down to you because Michelle wasn't there. All right, all in favor? And Michelle will abstain. Ms. Sherlock, Ms. Karras, and myself. Motion carries. 
Um, so we can move on to the bills for this evening. Mr. Parentasi, uh, could you walk us through tonight's bills that are in our packet? It would be my pleasure, Madam Chair. Um, so the bills for the uh, January 25th, 2022 um, bill roll total $49,314.05. They're extremely typical. Uh, the unusual uh, bill here is the Boston Fire Extinguisher Company because we had all of our fire extinguishers recharged, inspected and recharged as needed. Um, we have uh, special education costs, uh, transportation costs. We have reimbursement to uh, Vinny who um, charged uh, some items on his credit card, uh, Mr. Gagliolo. Uh, and the same with uh, Ms. Katsos and Ms. Delisio. So those three items that are, are pay, going to be paid to uh, our staff are reimbursements for um, items that we had to charge um, every, it seems like every month I'm saying this to you, uh, without a credit card to use, uh, there are lots and lots of things, a growing number of things that are available only online and we have to use our personal credit cards. Um, I have talked to the town accountant about it and the town administrator and the town accountant are hesitant to authorize a credit card for the district. They do have one for the town, but what it would entail is we'd have to go up, get the credit card um, authorization, come back, do the business, so I'm still working on it. Hopefully in the near future, we'll have a solution to that. The other thing I wanna mention is that the National Grill, uh, Grid electric bill is $3,758.53. That is a bill that ends on the 20, the bill period ends on the 27th of December, which is just about the time where most of our LED lights be, were installed. The bill is approximately 8% lower than last year, but it's even more impressive. Uh, it was a 33 day billing cycle as compared to a 30 or 31 day billing cycle. So uh, next month we should be able to see a more fully developed savings because of the LED tr uh, transitions. Once again, I wanna remind you that we, at this point we only have half of our lights or LED, but um, so the ultimately after the phase two is over, that savings would be greater. Madam Chair, with your permission, I would respectfully request that a member of the school committee make a motion to pay the invoices dated uh, January 25th, 2022 for $49,314.05. Um, so, Mr. Parandazzi, there's two different amounts for National Grid. One was 3,700 and one is 4,400. Yes, ma'am. Is that, what is the other amount? Or is that typical for? No, uh, the $4,400 bill is for our gas. Bill. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. That's okay. I know. I do the same thing. I, I have to go dive into the paperwork which typically, obviously, in a non-COVID environment, you would see all the details and all the backup. So you have to, please never hesitate asking a question. I'll be happy to make, oh, go ahead, Pai. No, no, go ahead, Lauren. <laughs> you got it before I did. I'll make a motion to approve the invoices uh, for the school committee meeting January 25th, 2021, as detailed in our packet in the amount of 49 $1,314.05. Yeah, it'll just be uh, 2022. Oh, that's right. I just read the number blindly. Yeah, exactly, I saw that. 2022. Um, can I have a second? I'll second that. Yes. Um, all in favor of approving the bills as written, Ms. Sherlock, Ms. Karras, Ms. Sam and myself, and the motion carries. Um, so our next, order of business is um, old business, and, and we'll start off with the COVID-19 updates. 
Uh, Mr. Parentasi, could you give us an update on COVID-19? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, it would be my pleasure. I'm going to divide this COVID into two items as uh, is reflected on the agenda. One would be the historical uh, and current uh, situation. And the second would be the new uh, protocols that we believe are going to be going into a play, into place as early as uh, the middle of next week. So uh, as always, I will begin with the town data. As of today, from January 2nd to January 15th, there have been uh, 89 positive cases in the Hunt as a, as a whole, and 606 residents have been tested for COVID. The um, 1,702 of our 3,234 residents uh, have been vaccinated and boosted, uh, which is 53%. And obviously there are significant numbers of very young uh, population that the, the numbers are zero. So um, the highest age group is 65 to 74 years old that 81% have been fully vaccinated or vaccinated and boosted. And the lowest group is 20 to 29 year olds, and that's 37%. Uh, but overall of the uh, individuals who can be vaccinated, the number is about 70%, which is very good. The school data. Now, our data is slightly different than the town data because we go back into the December break. So starting in the December break, uh, up until today, Again, our, the town data ended on the 15th. Ours goes through today. We have had four, 40 positive students. We have had 35 close contacts for a total of 75. We have had eight positive staff tests and 16 close contacts. Now, I want to remind everyone that close contacts of our students and staff don't mean it, it does not mean in school. It's close contacts that were identified by the public health department and or our school nurse, and they were outside of the school, but we keep track of them and, and we keep uh, good records on them. So we had 75 total case managements of students, 24 of staff for a total of 99. Um, and uh, it continues, it is slightly lower. In the town, it is lower. Uh, we are seeing a few less uh, close contacts. So our testing program is as follows. On Tuesday, when we do the pool testing, also called the routine safety testing, we have 151 students present. 104 of those have parent guardian permission to be tested. And we now have 44 students who are exempt from testing, either because they uh, have had COVID or they have tested positive. Um, so our, our number of students who are being pool, pooled tested is very high we have less than fewer than two dozen students who aren't in one of those two categories uh, who are, are choosing their parents and guardians are choosing not to be tested. And that is, um, I, as I said, very high. Uh, Madam Chair, with your um, permission, uh, any questions? Mr. Pantazzi, do you know what percentage of our students and well, I think 100% of our staff have been vaccinated, but what's the percentage of our students that have been vaccinated? Do you know? If you uh, I, I, I do not. Okay. Uh, but I will find out that information if I can. I'm not sure I can, but um, I'm not sure it's, I'm, I'm able to be um, informed. Oh. But I, I'll, I'll look into it.
I should, uh, if I can get the number, uh, that's all I need, obviously. And I'll look into that first thing on Thursday. The other thing I want to mention is there, um, there has been a change in the letters I sent to parents and guardians. Uh, up until about a week and a half ago, we told the parents what grade level the positives were. Uh, based on the recommendation of both the public health nurse and the school nurse, uh, we stopped doing that. We simply informed parents and guardians that we have a case or two uh, that have been identified on that particular day. The reason for that is several. Number one, that the nurses were concerned that so many students were being identified that confidentiality could be broached. I know that's not um, typically what do is done when you simply send a number out, but parents and guardians are, are speaking to each other, obviously, and talking to each other about you know, who was the positive? And I have to remind the members of the school committee and any parents and guardians who are listening, because somebody goes home does not mean they were positive. It could have been a close contact. And so even if we told the parents and guardians what grade the student who tested positive was in, it still wouldn't explain some absences. As a matter of fact, lots of absences, more than are testing positive. That was number one. And then uh, the school, the public health nurse is adamant that our best practice and our behavior in our school should not be impacted by whether or not a student has tested positive for two reasons. Number one, we should, we should be doing the universal precautions for COVID-19 transmissions whether we have positive people around us or not. And two, by the time we send the letter, the positive student isn't there anymore. So parents can't make a decision to send their children to school or not based on that information. So um, throughout this, you have led me extremely well to follow the data, which we have done from day one. And obviously I'm going to be listening to the to train medical people rather than uh, making my own decision. The one decision I did make until this point is to continue sending letters at all. Most of my colleagues have simply stopped doing it for the reasons I just gave you. But uh, I do think that uh, it helps. I'm, ho I'm hoping, frankly, that the day I don't send a letter, everybody cheers and uh, <laughs> And it's, and it's a cause for celebration. So I did want to mention that um, up front. So one of the questions I had was, um, you know, thinking back to previous years, we would, you know, historic, and I think I mentioned this to you, we had historically been notified of, um, you know, any communicable uh, condition within the classroom. So, you know, uh, somebody had strep throat in your child's classroom. These are the symptoms of stress, strep throat if your child has it you know, be, be aware, flu, hand, foot and mouth, things like that. So one of the questions I had, um, you know, with this transition to not identifying the classroom is, um, you know, is that going to change how we, how that, how those sorts of identifications are made? What I'm hearing from you is that the difference is that in a typical year when COVID wasn't present, kids were, you know, close, weren't wearing masks. And so there was a higher risk that your child in a typical year in a classroom might have been exposed to the flu or strep throat or hand, foot, mouth and might develop those symptoms. And so what I'm hearing from you is the rationale in, in not identifying the classroom is because with our safety measures in place, and as you pointed out, you know, once the letter is out, the, the you know, potential um, close contact is then removed from the classroom, it wouldn't change I practice because, you know, as we're following these safety measures, the risk of exposure to COVID or honestly anything would be reduced. Is that what you're saying? Uh, Madam Chair, through you to the members of the school committee. Uh, yes, that is that is precisely what I have been told by the um, 
by the public health nurse and our school nurse. In addition, um, I did ask that exact question and they are contemplating whether or not we would continue that practice in the, in the future. Um, interestingly enough, one of my thoughts is in the future, when that quote outbreak is present, perhaps what we should do is have that class wear masks for a few period for a short period of time. I don't know, uh, but the uh, the nurses are considering whether to continue that practice or not. Um, it, it's a very good question. So, so you know, I can I can say that um, from my perspective, when the letters came out, it creates anxiety, and with the letters coming out without identifying what classroom it's in, it creates even more anxiety. And for the exact reasons that you mentioned, I don't think that letter should be sent out anymore. I think that we have protocols in place and parents should be notified when a student, their, when their, you know, if their student is a close contact so that they can screen their child appropriately or, um, you know, have them stay home or do whatever is, is, you know, appropriate. But I, I would argue that I would, I would support not sending the COVID letters at all. And I think, you know, parents in, I, I mean, I, I obviously can't speak for other parents, but I would anticipate it would actually reduce anxiety. Uh, Madam Chair, is your wish to have a discussion and ask the school committee for I, a decision? I, I mean, I think it's worth a discussion. And I don't know, you know, Mr. Parentazzi, it sounds like other schools have made a similar step to they're no longer, you know, sending letters. Um, but it's, I think it's worth discussing. I don't know if that's, is that a decision that we would make or you would make it in, in, in this, you know, with the recommendations of the health committee at the school, but if other school com committee members have an opinion, it might be worth hearing. I think. Um, my opinion, opinion on it, Gina, is, is the same. I think I've expressed before that, you know, we have mitigation procedures in place. And I do think that there are several parents who feel the breach of confidentiality. And, you know, at the end of the day, how are you changing your behavior based on this letter that we're receiving? I just don't see a, a need for it to continue. That would be my point. I think that all makes a lot of sense. I think personally, I would be comfortable with the decision being made by the school nurse, the public health nurse, and the superintendent. Um, but I think all these points are are really well founded and worth discussion. I too am in agreement. You know, it, it really is. Uh, I, I think, you know, whatever the recommendation is by the school nurse and other health authorities. Madam Chair, if I if I may elaborate, and I, I clearly feel and see the, the sense of the school committee, I do want you to know that I was not resisting the recommendation of the public health nurse and the school nurse. My point was we're about to send a huge change in our protocols out. I asked them if it was okay if we waited Clearly, I wanted to discuss this with you and and uh, feel and know your opinions, which I do now. Uh, so um, we will add that to the communication that we send uh, when we're talking about the uh, the new um, at home testing program that is next on our agenda so that parents don't have to deal with multiple informations. You know, we're gonna send that out by email, we're gonna post it, uh, and obviously it will be a very significant change because um, students will actually be, be bringing test kits home. So uh, we need to inform the parents to look for them. Um, Mr. Parentazzi. It, it would be, uh, in my opinion, but of course I defer definitely, this is, I think, within the purview of the school nurse and, and you, 
but um, in my opinion, I would be in favor of if the letters aren't going to go out, I would kind of hope that also, like Gina mentioned, you know, that this kind of be consistent. If, if letters are going to go out about strap, they should go out about COVID, in my opinion. And if they're going to go out about COVID, they should go out about strap. But I think if they're not, they're not. It's like a policy on communicating about infectious diseases as opposed to one isolated illness. Um, so I would be in favor of looking at it in that light and not treating it differently. So I would just want to be consistent either way. And I think I really respect what I'm hearing so far about, you know, I think communication is really important when it can lead to a change in behavior or, you know, something that can help protect you more. Um, and I think that was the point behind the strep throat letters and, you know, and other communicable diseases back in, in those days, because we could do something differently. We didn't know to be on the lookout for these symptoms in particular with our kids at that time. And it was an added opportunity. Um, and if I don't have a strong opinion either way on these letters, um, and I do, I do want to kind of step back if we can and allow the school to decide on their own, but I could argue it back and forth personally. Um, sometimes people feel like they want to know just because that reduces their anxiety. Yeah. Oh, it's a tough one, but um, I would just advocate for it being consistent with infectious diseases across the board. I will communicate that sense to the uh, school nurse and the public health nurse. And if um, there is a difference because of the mask wearing and the, the uh, excuse me, there's a potential difference down the road because of the mask wearing and the, uh, the physical distancing. But I do hear the need for us to be consistent. Yeah, that's the only other thing that I would add is that um, you know, what's decided upon now in this moment, you know, could obviously change in the future, you know, assuming that we'll eventually move forward and not be wearing masks at school anymore. And, and so obviously, you know, a year from now, if, if there's flu in the classroom or strep and, and we're not taking the safety <laughs> precautions, it might be more important, but I agree with Lauren that COVID shouldn't be test, you know, treated any different than any other communicable disease. So at that time, you know, based upon our practices within the school, it should be treated similarly. Okay. Right, right now, for example, and people might already be aware, but in Swan Scott Middle School, um, you know, letter emails are still going out to parents about positive cases, or at least they were up until, I can't remember if I got one or not today, because I, I mean, we get them all the time. So it, it almost doesn't matter if I get one or not. Um, but um, but they have still been going out. They've never identified the the grade in particular. It's just a, you know, a case in our community. I don't know if it's five cases. I don't know if it's one case. That part doesn't really matter to me either. Um, what matters is if I'm if my child is identified as someone who's you know in particular at risk because of a specific kind of contact. Um, but those letters continue to to come, and I guess I'm just saying it because it's like a sister district and doesn't mean, again, it should never mean that we need to do something the same way just because Swam Scott does. It's just, you know, we share an educational um, pool and I'm just bringing it up. Yeah, right now we're, we are, our protocol is the same as Swam Scott. Right. Right, right now. Uh, letters without identifying grades. Right. And that seemed, it, as a, yeah, I haven't heard, I haven't heard any negative pushback on that particular model, but I understand that people have different opinions. Yeah. Okay, so Madam Chair, what I believe I have heard is that uh, when the information goes out about the um, at-home testing pro protocols, which I'm about to discuss with you, we will also inform parents that letters are no longer going to be sent with a positive uh, case or close contact is identified in school that the communication will be with the parents and guardians privately and confidentially uh, as they have been. And that we, it, we are enforcing uh, very strongly our protocols for mask wearing and, and physical distancing. That's the recommendation of the health committee. It sounds like we all support that decision. Okay. Yeah. And I'll check with both nurses to make sure that if nothing has changed. And if there has been a change, uh, we will continue to send the letters out without names until the next school committee meeting when you will have a chance to address it again. Without grades, yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Madam Chair, the next item is 4B, and that's our protocols in your in your uh, packet. And uh, you have the communication from the commissioner dated January 18th. Uh, immediately upon receiving this uh, memo, I took spoke with both the public health department and the uh, school nurse and uh, they wholeheartedly supported the concepts that are uh, contained in this new program this program is based on data not opinion as of january 9th 503,312 test state tests had been conducted in public schools in the commonwealth of massachusetts 98.6% of them were negative. So the experts looked at that data and said, how better can we spend our energy and time rather than having 503,000 tests being done with 497,000 negatives coming back. So they devised the program, which uh, is outlined in this memo. Uh, I immediately, uh, based on the um, opinion of the, of the nurses, uh, did a preliminary uh, scheduling that we would participate, knowing full well that if the members of the school committee to this evening chose to uh, not to support it, that I could quickly go online to uh, the person who is our contact, uh, Ms. Wu, and uh, withdraw us from the program, which we can do any time. So there's two important things to remember. Number one is what the district has to do to be a participant versus an individual parent and guardian, because they're different. In order for the district to participate in the new statewide at-home testing program. So should I respond to Dave and just say that? what we talked about pardon i think she, there's someone who was um unmuted by accident and it's been a, it's been corrected oh i'm sorry i thought someone was i had a question or comment okay so the district has to do the following we have to participate in the pooled the safety routine testing that's the pcr test which we do every tuesday and the symptomatic testing in order to do the at-home test and that's staff and students who can sign up for them. We have to continue our protocols with mask wearing and we have to continue our protocol with a minimum of three feet distance and of course, you know, we uh, extended that to six feet in the cafeteria where the, and wherever students are indoors without masks. Each parent and guardian can choose all of those pooled symptomatic at home. None of those, just the pool symptomatic or just the at home. And we will be sending an electronic message with an electronic, very, very uh, easy sign up, uh, which is which is actually, they've changed it from the previous one. They're calling this one an opt-in, just to differentiate it. So if a parent has already signed up for the pooled testing and 104 students are now taking that, they still have to opt in to the at-home tests. If we participate in the at-home test, and uh, I've already signed up, so the school committee, you may choose to take action or you, or you may choose to just leave it as an administrative decision. We will get a two-package test for every student for every week and a two-package test of a rapid test both of these packages are rapid tests for a staff member every week. 
in actuality, we've already received the ones for the staff. They came in late this afternoon. So what is going to happen in our school is that parents would get at-home tests, hopefully use them, communicate with our health department if one of them is positive, and then we would have them we would have an appropriate medical response, which I'm hesitant to say because right now I'm not sure, but either stay home until a PCR in the pool or not, but the test and stay program would no longer be in existence. The advantage to this is that we identify the positive students and staff before they come to school, not after. That's the theoretical advantage. Um, There is uh, our school nurse and our public health nurse uh, participated in a webinar and they have given me the information I just gave you. And uh, there's lots more details that will work out before we send the information home. But it seems like uh, as the information becomes more available, they, um, they are adapting the tests protocols. Again, the at-home tests are the antigen test. The pool tests are the PCRs. So parents who want to sign up for both would have both done every week. So I would imagine that the theory on that, and of course, then the symptomatic testing would continue. The theory on that is that by having uh, both of them uh, the chances of a um, an accurate testing would be heightened. Sounds great. It's so good to see the data too that you know close contact test and stay results ninety eight point six negative. That just proves mitigation strategies work and school is safe. That's really wonderful. It's fantastic. And thank you so much to you and to our nurses for doing all of this work and the webinar attendance and all of the you know, reviewing of all of the, the data that the rationales for these policies, you know, the policies themselves and how they work. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. I, I, I have to be very excited and positive about the results that we have had so far. Once again, the close contact tracing has indicated no transmission in school. And I know that's that's with the numbers I read earlier, it's almost hard to believe that we, the nurse hasn't found one. Uh, but that is in fact the case. Um, if we found one, we would then trace back why. You know, did a class have an activity where they took their masks off? Did, uh, did, was there a student in that class who had a tremendously difficult time continuing to wear a mask? But so far, um, I have been told, obviously I don't do the tracing myself, but I have been told that all of the both positive cases and close contacts have been identified as uh, taking place outside of the Johnson Elementary School. And that's just great. This helps inform us of the rationale for the nurses opinion that the letters don't need to go out because if we're saying that we've had no transmission in school then a notice to parents and guardians that there's a case in school doesn't result in any change or any information right. that would you know it, it just further informs us as to their decision making in that regard so that's very helpful that's that's exactly what they said to me it was the confidentiality the absence yeah. of a change in protocol based on the information Therefore, the uh, your decision to support sending no letters makes all the sense in the world. Mm -hmm. That does make very good sense. Thank you. So, Karen Tazi, I did, um, you know, just have um, a question in terms of I think when families have close contact at home and not close contacts at school, just to be clear about what that means for families participating in this program because um, 
you know, I, I it seems to be from what I read that if somebody is healthy and is not testing positive, that they are able to come to school regardless of their family status, which, you know, um, I could see being a benefit to, to keep healthy kids in school. <laughs> that is correct. Um, there are two requirements under the program that I did not state that are in the minutia. Number one, parents are obligated and the in the opt-in statement that they um, will agree to says that they will uh, contact the school nurse uh, whenever there's a positive case. And two, we, we must contact the our local board of health, which obviously I've already done, but we have to contact our, our local health authorities so they are aware and can find out via a question to our staff if a positive case is reported uh, they get the information and then there is a close contact follow-up outside of school that won't stop so if people choose to participate in this program um if if there are members of the family or, you know, if there are other members who, you know, for siblings, for example, if you have one child who tests positive and the other child is testing negative, they would still be required to follow the close contact protocol. Or I think that's kind of confusing, you know, I guess. It, it, it is. And I am going to simply say, uh, because this is the only thing I'm comfortable saying, that the family would be responsible for following the directives of the public health department. Okay. And I guess the other the other question that I had that I, you know, wanted to make sure of in terms of uh, supporting personnel is that uh, families who participate are only required to report to the school nurse the positive cases. I just, you know, would find it burdensome if, you know, uh, you know, the nurse would have to track down all of the participating families, or is it the the assumption that if she's not hearing from them that they are negative? That but is correct. You know, track people down for results. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in in summary, positive cases are called in then the school nurse will communicate that to the appropriate uh, people. We're still reporting that, for example, to the DESE uh, weekly. And then the uh, public health department would be informed and they would follow up and determine, frankly, whatever they're going to be determined. I mean, things are changing so rapidly. This isn't going to in effect till next week. I'm hesitating saying what's going to happen next week right. because uh, I only know what we're doing today. Right. Yeah. I understand. Thank you. But I think overall, it's a very positive step. Uh, I think having students taking the antigen and the PCR test on a weekly basis is a real benefit. Um, and from the overall scheme of cases that I've heard uh, as of five o'clock today, it seems as if things are calming down a little bit. And I emphasize a little bit. <laughs> Update on protocol is going to go out next week. What we're going to do is um, obviously I didn't, I didn't want the school nurse and the public health nurses to expend too much time on this other than the time we already did, uh, prior to uh, talking to you, making sure that you were in support of it. And um, so what we're gonna do is this week, we're gonna work on all the communications. Uh, there are uh, templates that we can use and get the information out by, <clears throat> excuse me, by the end of this week. The, <laughs> Mr. Andrews is going to chuckle when I say this. I'm always hesitant about putting too much labor into something that hasn't happened yet. 
Let me give you a concrete example. Uh, we were told to send somebody to pick up t tests on a particular day during the uh, vacation. And my initial comment was, let's not send anything out until we have them in our hands. Well, the information got sent out the day we were supposed to pick them up. And of course, when we went to pick them up, they weren't there. The good news is they were there the very next day. We didn't have to wait two weeks. So the reason I'm hedging a little bit is I have the test kits for the staff, but I haven't seen the ones for the students yet. So I'm going to assume, and we all know what happens then, that they're going to not miss their deadline by very much. So uh, I haven't sent it out yet, short answer, but we are ready. As a matter of fact, I talked to the nurse uh, six o'clock tonight. Is that it for COVID updates? Is that it for COVID updates? I'm sorry, what? Is that it for COVID updates? Oh God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have much shorter meetings when we don't have to talk about COVID anymore. I was talking to one of my colleagues and, and I said, how you doing? And she said, I am so covid out. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll have much quicker meetings. Um, do you want to go over the fourth draft of the budget then? I would love to, Madam Chair. The fourth draft, there is a uh, minor change that I would like to uh, bring to your attention. Last meeting, I told you that uh, we didn't have a lot of the labor costs nailed down, but we were working through our other budgets. On uh, page four of the budget, uh, the next to last line has special education transportation. Last week, or excuse me, last version, that number was $52,726. Subsequently, I have uh, worked with the director of special education, Mary DeGuardia, and we have identified that that number would not be sufficient to cover the transportation costs for the current students who are transported. There are more students being transported uh, right now than we had uh, at the end, uh, this time last year when I, uh, we were making the budget. So uh, in the version you see in front of you, that number is now $67,726. Therefore, the increase in the budget year to year is $111,394 or 2.62%. And um, once again, I uh, will continue to uh, fine tune it. Um, I don't have the data in front of me. I don't have the schedule, but I know we are scheduled to have your hearing in February. And once the school committee approves the version of the budget in front of you at that time, then I would communicate it to uh, Ms. Beatty and her colleagues uh, you know, on the finance committee through the town uh, administrator and the town accountant. Are we gonna be able to have that meeting in February if, um, if we're not done with NTA negotiations? Uh, I hope we are. Okay. But if we're not, um, I believe we should move forward because okay. the finance committee does in fact need our budget. Uh, I can certainly talk to the town accountant and uh, the town administrator about delaying it maybe two weeks, but uh, we're, we're going to be the last department, I believe anyway, for the finance committee to see the budget. I believe the town accountant was finalizing the other departments today. And I, I did uh, give her a forecast version of uh, the fifth um, budget the, 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 um, so that she would have it. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. And just to remind the members of the school committee, I already reduced the electric cost based on the projected savings due to the LED. Um, do you want to give an update? It looks like on the agenda, we have the facility use update. 
I would love to. Thank you, Madam Chair. In your packet, I put the entire packet that a an applicant to use our facility is now receiving. It is the historic um, document. In um, in addition, we have added the student staff visitor ready for school checklist. We have added the curriculum enrichment event visitor request form and we have added a visitor pass log so um these are required uh due to COVID 19. uh the the only group that we have now scheduled will begin tomorrow it is uh, adult basketball they have done everything they needed to do, including uh, half of the fee up front. So the contact person for that group will have each member sign in and do the attestation that is on the visitor requirement list uh, every meeting. The curriculum enrichment event visitor request form is for our PTO or Boston University or Northeastern University or some other organization that we have a relationship with to fill out, it goes to uh, Mr. Andrews and then we provide the other documents. Uh, we have had a couple of other inquiries, but at this point, no one has um, submitted any paperwork other than the adult basketball which begins tomorrow evening and goes into april great and that'll take place after the after school program has completed for the day yes uh they are um here at 6 30 to 9 p.m i did shorten the time frame a little bit in order to give our custodian a full hour afterwards so uh we're not allowing anybody in, in the to be in the building after 9 p.m and we are allowing them to start at 6 p.m because um i have been uh told that by 6 p.m everyone is outside the building okay that sounds great thank you and then the, uh, and the applicant for each of these events understands that they're responsible for adhering to the mask policies and all of that yeah the, uh, the other difference uh, this year is me being um, somewhat obsessive. I speak to each of the contact people personally That's to great. make sure that they fully understand the responsibilities they're taking on, which are greater than at any time in the past. Thank you. Thank you. So along the lines of facilities, do you have an update on our facilities in general? Yes, I do. Uh, first of all, we got our first bid back for two cafeteria fans in the ceilings. And uh, I was stunned, to say the least. The uh, estimate was $37,400. Uh, needless to say, we're not doing that. So... <laughs> we went from putting two huge commercial ceiling fans in that were literally 12 feet across to a larger number of much less expensive fans uh maybe a little bit higher quality than we would have in our homes but certainly not of the quality of of these commercial fans which are uh in excess of ten thousand dollars each um so we have other companies bringing in a bids. We would have had to do that anyway, uh, in addition to for my peace of mind, because currently your school committee policy requires a bid for anything over $25,000. And we are gonna talk about that later in the evening. Um, the good news is the HVAC system has been working in the cafeteria with the, uh, much less costly repairs that we've done. If you remember, we had $35,000 for a new system. I indicated to you I wasn't really pleased with just going from what we had to brand new. 
Uh, so we, we spent about uh, $11,000, I believe, with new parts and it's working. I'm almost embarrassed to tell you that about three weeks ago, uh, something dawned on me. The only time this system stopped working was in the morning after it was turned off all night. It didn't seem to be able to, to get started again. So I made the arbitrary decision to just leave it on all the time and it's working fine. <laughs> um, there may be a perception that we're wasting gas, and, but I, I did some research and I talked to a couple of experts who said that in a room that size, by letting the temperature drop, you're probably using as much gas to get the temperature back up in the morning as you would have used to keep it at that temperature all the time. So, so far, so good. Uh, a, a not so good thing is um, we've had the building vandalized. Uh, now it's twice and um, we are looking at the film and working with the police department to see if we can identify the individual. And we obviously are working on a way to get the building, um, the brick uh, clean, but it's still there. Uh, it's going to take a, uh, a significant amount of effort in the right um, cleaner to get it off, uh, but we will. And we hopefully will be able to see something on our film. Uh, and if I, ho I hope it was ever doing that stays busy in some other way, uh, rather than putting some slogan on our wall. Uh, back to good news. All of our annual inspections were done. Uh, you saw the uh, extinguisher cost uh, this evening. Uh, all of our emergency lights and our generator were inspected and passed on the 22nd of December. Our fire alarm was inspected on the 12th of January. And the last thing was our uh, sprinkler system was inspected on the 25th of January, which was, uh, by the way, 6 a.m. today. Um, and everything passed. So we are waiting for the uh, inspection uh, certificate from the city. Madam Chair, I'll go right to 5B with your permission. Um, sure. Right now, we are not experiencing shortages. I would love to tell you we're not experiencing cost increases, but that would be a fib. Uh, a lot of things are going up. Uh, I think our budget's still in a satisfactory condition, um, but um, the cost of, of a lot of things is going up, as you well know, from, from our own personal uh, expenditures. Uh, 5C, January 14th is our, uh, our, was our professional development day and it went very, very well. And uh, I don't know I, if Mr. Andrews is going to give it any more depth to that at this time, but uh, I will just move on. And I already talked about the cafeteria fans. So we are done that area of the agenda, Madam Chair unless a member of the school committee has any questions. Well, that's a good segue uh, to Mr. Andrews for the principal's report. Mr. Andrews. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd be happy to present that. Uh, starting out with teaching and learning, uh, I'd like to say that the uh, public library collaboration is off to a great start with Director Sharon Hawks coming to the school on a regular basis, uh, providing interactive lessons on media, books, and research and I, I think it's an excellent addition to the school and I just want to thank her for taking the initiative to uh, come to the school and take this on. Students are seeing her every other week uh, for a full period and on the opposite weeks they're continuing to see uh, Ms. Fiore for their typical library class. Uh, both times they're getting a chance to check out books in the library as they always do uh, the ones with Ms. Hawks are a little bit extended uh, as they have some uh, additional content included. I also want to let you know that we've been implementing a program called Max Scholar, which started out in the, in the uh, special education department 
as an intervention program for students who are behind in reading or that need a boost in the, the area of literacy. And Ms. Brett has been training teachers on how to use this in the classroom. Uh, it's an in-class intervention that a, a classroom teacher can use and it's online. So teachers, students can use it with their Chromebooks. And it's nice because it's tailored right to that student. So if they're having a difficult time with identifying certain letter sounds, um, she and the teacher can program it for that. You don't have to have an IEP to use the program. And uh, it's nice to see because it's a way to help students get on track. And especially when we've been having gaps with COVID-19, uh, get students back on track with reading. Uh, in a fun way. And it's based on the Orton Gillingham system, which is a really well founded and uh, research based program. I'd like to also let you know that we're continuing with iReady. Right now we're doing the iReady assessment number two. We have three a year. Last year was the first year we did this, and this is the second year. It's a brief online assessment. Uh, each We do an ELA and a math. Each one takes about 45 minutes. They're done again in class with the student Chromebooks and, um, and uh, Mr. Lockwood helped set those up and uh, it's just become a regular part of the program and it's nice to be able to chart progress with student learning. Finally, uh, I wanna thank the uh, Massachusetts Partnerships for Youth. They did a wonderful program on what called What's Up With Bullying uh, and they presented uh, two different workshops for students to get them familiar with bullying, what it is, what it isn't, and what it is to be an upstander, someone who can uh, stand up for kids and either report things. And the most important part is to not just stand by the sidelines while someone else is having a hard time. What can they do to intervene? Uh, under events, I'm gonna skip down to the events that we have listed uh, next. Wednesday is the winter walk to school day. Uh, this was a wonderful occasion last year. We actually are still having students riding their bikes to school uh, and walking. Great to see. And so we will be uh, celebrating this next Wednesday. So I encourage everyone to walk and bike to school uh, as is safe. And then February 8th, students in the lower grades will be making a 100th day celebration uh, on, their, on their floor level to celebrate the fact that they made it to the 100th day of school. And that's, we're expecting February 8th, uh, expecting good weather through then. Uh, and it could be moved depending on what Mr. Parentazzi says about the school calendar as we go. Under facility, uh, this is the last area you wanted to speak about tonight. I wanted to remind everybody about a proposal that I've been working on uh, through the Community Preservation Act. I've been in touch with Tony Barletta and Zach from DPW on creating a walking and biking path that would start at Flash Road Playground, would come over to the school uh, and follow the Nahant Heritage Trail, which is already in existence from Lowlands parking lot through the forest area there. Uh, it goes through the Flash Road Playground, but it's kind of hard to follow there because it's all grass and not walked on very much. From there, it goes by the community garden and then through the forest again, up through Coast Guard housing. And my vision is to have a stone dust path installed in the area between the Flash Road playground and the school, which would let kids walk and bike behind the DPW and the fire uh, station um, and adults as well as a walking trail. And then also encourage folks to go explore Bailey's Hill and the historic areas there where the bunkers are. Um, part of this is to encourage exercise, also to connect with historic areas and to uh, encourage a different mode of transportation that doesn't require carbon dioxide. And um, I'm hoping that the school committee is in favor of this proposal. It will go before town meeting um, next year, this year. And if there was a short discussion about that or a couple of comments, um, I'd appreciate it. I love the idea. Thank you so much. Good. Excellent. I wanna, I wanna mention that NEF has um, provided a letter of support. I am asking a, a few other organizations to 
provide a letter of support and also they'll be providing some signage to identify habitats and plants along the way. And that concludes my report. Thank you for that. Okay. Would you like letters of support from school committee members who are who are supportive? Is that helpful to you? And, you know, that'd be really helpful. And um, I have a draft um, with some pieces about it that I'd be happy to send to the chair um, right. if you'd be able to if you'd be able to circulate it, Ms. Lane. Yeah, um, absolutely. Great, fantastic. And Madam Chair, if I can help uh, facilitate that letter, please let me know. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Parentazzi. You're very welcome. Uh, so we'll move on to community correspondence. Uh, so this is the time during the meeting that we'll take uh, comments or questions from the community. Um, if you have a comment or question, if you could please type it into the chat, um, just include your uh, full name and address. And if, uh, and if you would like to speak, please indicate that you would like to speak. Um, Looks like Debbie, you have already uh, typed into the chat. So if you would like to unmute yourself, um, Debbie, use a Katie, I'm sorry, from 25. Who's got the key? Who's got the key? Thank you. Katie. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. Um, so appreciate the discussion earlier about the notifications um, to the parents about the grade level um, for a positive COVID, um, but I really, um, just have to respectfully disagree completely with everything. You know, it's really taking um, vital information away from the parents, it's taking away their power to decide for themselves what's best for their families and taking in their individual family health concerns into account. Um, you know, I think it's as much of a health issue as a communication issue. I don't know why the administration doesn't want to have clear and transparent communication to the parents. It seems very strange to restrict communication when it isn't necessary. It's really a, kind of like an Orwellian policy that's just really sowing distrust within the parents. Um, you were wondering before, you know, like what would parents do different with this information if, the, if somebody's already been sent home? So a lot, right? Because so I don't have any knowledge of how a close contact is determined. And I'm supposed to just blindly trust that that's happening correctly. If I know there's five positives in my son's class of 11, as opposed to zero, you know, I'm going to feel very differently about that. And I'm going to make different decisions about whether I want to send him to school or not. Um, this is really important information, especially when my son comes and tells me that his classmates aren't wearing masks correctly, desks are not three feet apart. Um, in the cafeteria or the classroom, you know, I have concerns and I should have the right as a parent to make that decision myself um, because I don't know guys, like what in a haunt you're living in. If you think, if you're worried about confidentiality of knowing the grade level, like I don't know anybody that's going around trying to figure out who's positive unless they're concerned about the health of a child, right? So I just don't understand this issue whatsoever and I don't know why information is being restricted. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments, Debbie. Uh, Meredith Byam from 59 Little Mahant Road. If the spread is happening outside of school, then taking away notification seems counterproductive. If outside playdates are where the spread is happening, then having knowledge is power here. I need to see if there's any other comments and then we can you know, perhaps collectively discuss. Any comments or from the school committee? Well, 
Madam Chair, if, if I may, I think uh, both uh, comments about the knowledge regarding positives are uh, well-founded from a parent's point of view about the knowledge surrounding the students with the exception that if a student is actively positive, A, they're not in school, and B, they should be quarantined at home, not at play dates. Now, I certainly understand why that takes a level of trust, but um, the fact that there's no, there hasn't been, according to uh, case tracing, transmission at school uh, provides a certain amount of comfort about what we're doing here. I can only say that we hope that the parents whose students are identified as positive or close contacts are in fact keeping their children away from other children for the uh, requisite period of time. Obviously, I have no idea, but I, I would hope that that would be the case. And just add on to that, you know, what's happened historically has been notification that there's someone in a certain grade who's tested positive and not the information about who that person is in particular by the school. So when it comes to arranging play dates, the school has never communicated, you know, who it is who has COVID-19, nor should they for confidentiality reasons. Um, and this is, this is, you know, HIPAA law, this is healthcare law, it's not a matter of opinion, it's a matter of law. So um, when it comes to identifying, you know, one person within a grade, um, and then, you know, a student within that grade still, you know, socializes other students in that grade, it, that's a matter of communication, like Mr. Parentas is saying, among the parents and guardians, um, you know, to have uh, discussions together and decide together if people feel as comfortable. And, and although I think it's important to have these discussions at the school committee meeting, um, you know, our role is, um, you know, policy and uh, I would defer decisions regarding health care to the recommendations that are coming from, you know, people that are more knowledgeable about those policies than us, than me, at least. I, I mean, I guess I won't speak for anybody else. Um, and so I guess the question to us is if we would want to make up different policies than, you know, what's being recommended um, by people that spend a lot of time thinking about this and making up these policies. And I just don't think that I'm knowledgeable enough in this process to make up our own policies. Um, so that's why, you know, my decision is to defer to the people that know and that are, you know, basing these decisions on data. And I think it makes sense that once, um, you know, the most important thing, and, and you know, and if you have questions about how close contacts are identified, um, I'm sure that that's information that can be, you know, I, I think it's available on the on the school website. But if it's not, we can certainly make that available, um, so that you know we can all understand how these you know decisions are being made. But the important thing is that if your student is identified as a close contact, you will certainly be notified. Um, and, um, you know, that once a, once a student is identified to test positive, they're obviously, you know, quarantining at home. And now we're gonna continue our safe practices uh, to mitigate the spread of COVID. So, I mean, that's, that's you know, sort of what guides my um, decision making is that I'm not more knowledgeable than the people that are making these regulations and they, they are based upon science. And by not voting on a school committee level, we're allowing the people with this expertise to be flexible and fluid. And if there are if there's different data that comes back from the state or the CDC that guides them in a different way and encourages different behavior, then they can pivot and send letters appropriately, communicate differently you know, without a policy being changed at a school committee meeting. Um, Debbie uh, would like to clarify the comment. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, so I, it, it's definitely apparent like what the definition of a close contact is, right? But it's not apparent how that's determined. Like is the classroom teacher saying it like, yes, this person is a close contact and this person's not a close contact because if my son's two feet away from somebody 
who tests positive and that person's not wearing their mask, the teacher could make a call and say, hey, not a close contact, but I might think something different based on what my child tells me, right? So I think the parents need to have the power to, to be able to make these decisions themselves. Um, and I disagree that this is a health decision that you guys are debating. It's a communications issue, right? So I'm in corporate communications, right? You never wanna hold back information from people if you don't have to. It, it's all about being open and transparent. And I just, it, it's, it's really hard to take that away. Um. Uh, Mr. Andrews or Mr. Prentazzi, do you want to um, speak to how the staff are um, monitoring for close contacts or how, uh, they, how they report close contacts? Madam Chair, I will speak to it in global terms because neither Mr. Andrews nor I are privy to the conversations or the questioning that takes place between the uh, CIC staff or the uh, school nurse or the public health nurse. Um, so there is a sequence of questions that are asked of staff and students, not just staff. And um, the decision is made by our school nurse based on the information that is gleaned from those uh, questions and answers. Thank you. Any other comments or any other um, correspondence um, outside of between our last meeting and today to the committee? Right. Seeing no further uh, correspondence, I'm going to close the chat and we can move on to our next order of business, which is new business, uh, preschool and kindergarten open house, which is coming up. Thank you, Madam Chair. The reason I put this on the agenda was simply to remind the members of the community and the school committee that this event is remote only. So I assume the appropriate terminology would be open electronics. But, uh, and I, I didn't want anyone to think that we were actually going to be hosting a, a mass meeting in the school. Uh, I was pretty sure you knew, but I wanted to be absolutely sure. Uh, the next item is an interesting one. Um, the school calendar, uh, 8B, uh, this is the first draft and I've incorporated, I've included not only the, the calendar itself, but I've included the state uh, list of um, required holidays, state holidays, and I've also included a month by, by no, month breakdown in the number of days for uh, students and staff members. And Madam Chair, it's my intention, um, although I have heard from the NTA uh, uh, late today that they don't have any issue with this uh, schedule, the calendar itself, I also have communicated with the superintendent's office in Swamscott. Uh, I would, uh, my intention would be to table this this evening and to put it on uh, for your determination at the next meeting to give you an opportunity to uh, consider it. I have a question and I think I know the answer but I just wanna bring it to everybody's attention that since last um, school year, Juneteenth became a national a federal holiday. So um, we had one snow day and it's more in regards to the calendar this year. We had one snow day. So the current school year is ending on a Thursday. But if we have two more, it wouldn't end on a Monday. It would end on Tuesday because the public holidays. That's I mean, right. I really, I will just, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it and make sure that it's communicated with the school. That way when people are, you know, calculating the last day of school, they take that into account. It's right at the yeah. end of the school year. You, you bring up a conundrum that I have been dealing with because the only way to really fix it is to move the beginning of school back into the next week 
yeah. just like you would me move the end of school into the next week. So right. I, I, I get the feeling from people here and from parents and guardians that starting school on a Thursday or Friday, you know, August 27th or 26th is probably not a good idea. Right. <laughs> and I see a lot of a shaking of heads. So that's why it is the way it is. Yeah, yeah. And we have been, you know, no, I'm not going to say yeah, that. No, but, not gonna, right, no, 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 don't say anything. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> right, you remember a few days, a few years ago, there was like no snow in January and then February and March were awful. So we will, we will zip our lips on that one. I'm going to defer that comment till July. <laughs> <laughs> At least June. Um, all right. So the, so we'll vote on that. We'll have that on the agenda to vote on at the next meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next item comes to you uh, in a roundabout way. Uh, we had a procurement audit by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and you haven't heard about it because it just happened and we did great. And there were just a couple of little doohickeys of internal processing that we had to fix. But during that procurement audit, the auditor looked at me and said, why is your school committee policy re requiring you to get bids if something exceeds $25,000? Uh, that state law was passed, uh, changed about a decade ago. It's now $50,000. So I said, I don't know. So I bring it to you with two comments. One is the state law requires purchases in it in excess of $50,000 to go out to bid and to uh, things between 10,000 and 50 can be gained. Uh, the, the bids can be an informal process of uh, getting uh, competitive bids. The second comment is we're a small district. Maybe 25,000 makes more sense. Um, but I bring it to your your table because it is your decision, not mine. I will do as the committee wishes, everything from changing, you know, writing a new policy for you next time that says 50,000, uh, picking some number between 25 and 50 if you so choose, or leaving it alone. I'm not recommending a change. I'm comfortable with 25. I think if you're comfortable and it sounds reasonable enough, we're small, but finances are finances. And I think when it comes to bids, that it's fine. It just means a little bit more paperwork. And, and I have the, I have a formula, you know, I have all the, the, the scheme all set up from the bus bids and the, uh, the lunch bids. So it, it's not a big deal. It's the one well. thing that, the one thing that would be different, if this number was $50,000, we would not have to go out for a bid for the food service. There is an advantage to that because we use a local vendor. Um, when you go for another bid, are you obligated to take the lower bid? No. Oh. And I mean, because I mean, obviously you're taking multiple things into account. Right. Uh, I just, yeah, I think that, you know, keeping it at the lower amount for us financially is advantageous. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, unless, you know, it's burdensome to get multiple, you know, quotes for more things, I wouldn't encourage a change in that policy. Yeah, and in your packet, I have the grids from the Department of uh, Revenue that explain all the things that are required. Madam Chair, if I may be so bold as to suggest, let me talk to the uh, direct the Director of Food Services, and let's table this, and I'll get back to you, because the more I look at this, the more I'm thinking that the reason it came to me is because she wanted it to be changed. Mm. And can I, I ask, apologize. Can I ask a question about um, food services? I know it's not about bidding, so it's a little bit off topic. Sure. Okay? Of course. 
Um, oh, if, if, but, if, the, if the chair. Yeah, so. of course, of course. <laughs> um, with the free lunches, um, you know, through the government for all the students, um, I know that we had our, you know, a nutritionist who was working with our director of food services to make sure that our lunches were in compliance with you know, meeting high dietary, you know, stand, um, high nutritional standards. And um, is that still operational despite the free lunch program? Or do we still have the oversight of our nutritionist or dietitian? Absolutely. Okay. As a matter of fact, I spoke with her this very day. Great. Yep. Nothing changes with the exception of we no longer require parents and guardians to provide us with financial information in order to determine free and reduced lunch. Everybody just gets it. Um, it's actually going to be a harsh reality when we go back to that. Yeah, I know it's been really nice. It's, it's an avoidance of a lot of paperwork. Yeah, it's great for the kids too. Fabulous. Um, it looks like we have a couple of donations to discuss next on the agenda. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, we are so fortunate to be uh, in the hot and to have such generosity in our community. The first thing uh, I would like the school committee to do is to accept a donation by Mr. Steve Belcher. It is of a magnificent remote controlled sailboat and um, it's, it's enormous. And it is beautiful, as you can see by the picture. And uh, it has been valued at two thousand dollars. And obviously, I uh, it's it's actually in Mr. Andrew's office right now. We're we're going to arm wrestle for uh, for next week. Uh, but I uh, fully recommend that the school committee accept that uh, item. It's beautiful. I also I'm going to do all three of them, if I may, Madam Chair. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Andrews himself has, uh, being an aficionado of uh, tag sales, has um, four red dart sleds, uh, zip fee sl sleds, uh, valued at $200 that he has donated to the school uh, for the use uh, in snow or sleet, I guess. And then the, the next page is the artwork items that have been donated by West Sam Bruce via the Peabody Essex Museum. These were an exhibit at the museum. And I, I have to bring uh, Mr. Andrews to the forefront because two of all of these are really a, a commentary on his reach out into the community and his positive relationships with people. Uh, each of these items, uh, obviously the one that he himself has donated, but the other two took place and uh, because of the relationships that he has built up with our community and our community members. So Mr. Andrews, thank you so much. The, um, the sculptures and benches and other items um, are valued at $3,000. So, Madam Chair, with your uh, permission, I would respectfully ask a member of the school com committee to make a motion to accept the RC sailboat valued at $2,000, the four sleds valued at $200, and the artwork from West Sam Bruce and the Peabody Essex Museum valued at $3,000. And I will make sure if you accept them to write letters. I will make a motion to accept the donations of the RC sailboat valued at $2,000, the four sleds valued at $200, and the um, various artwork um, from West Sam Bruce valued at $3,000. I'll second the motion. Ms. Garris, all in favor? The motion is written. Ms. Sherlock, Ms. Garris, Ms. Sam, and myself. Motion carries. Please uh, pass along our thanks and thank you, Mr. Andrews. My pleasure, Madam Chair. Thank you for those kind words, Superintendent Parentazzi. I got some nice feedback from the students saying, yeah, those benches are actually helpful. I can take my That's boots great. off over there. 
Oh, that's so, so great. Uh, you know, they're, they're great. And we'll, we'll have an outside stage that's going to be seven feet in diameter at the top of the forest playground on the asphalt section where students can dance so we can have performers. Um, we're, we're putting a varnish on it because it was inside. So Tony, uh, so Vinny Gagliolo was currently uh, varnishing it and we're putting a couple feet on the bottom so it stays off the ground. But um, they're really going to be useful and I think add a lot to the school. You've added so much creativity and beauty to the school. It's really amazing. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And thank you all for your recognition. Really appreciate it. Well deserved. Uh, and then we have personnel updates. Well, I have a smile. <laughs> Last week, I brought the harrowing tale to you of somebody I almost hired. Uh, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. In your packet, you have the uh, redacted resume of Kathleen Joyce Durland. Uh, Mrs. Durland is a experienced practitioner, an occupational therapist in many, many uh, venues. She has agreed to serve as our occupational therapist and she has agreed to serve as our team chair. So a journey that began, began in March of last year has been concluded. We are fully staffed. Great update. Um, so moving on to uh, new business from the committee. Um, I thought I, um, I asked to add in-person um, school committee meetings. I know that in the fall, we decided to continue meeting, um, you know, over Zoom. Uh, and we had discussed readdressing it with the new year. So I thought now's a good time to readdress, um, you know, going back to in-person meetings that would take place at the same uh, dates and times that we've set out. Uh, but they would take place at the town hall instead of over Zoom. Um, it seems to make sense that we could move forward with that, uh, but I'm open to discussion. I would love in-person meeting. <laughs> <laughs> My two cents. I think communication wise, it's so much easier to communicate in person than online. So, you know, this has served its purpose. I I would also be in agreement to go back to in person meetings. That not that I've ever been to one, but um to <laughs> I forgot that. That's right. Either. I haven't either. You're the only one. <laughs> maybe maybe I, we should I, Madam Chair, maybe we should have a trial month. <laughs> I can attest to the fact that in-person meetings are very nice. <laughs> I would also be in favor. Um, is Gina, is there an opportunity to to involve um, the audience by Zoom if desired to have a hybrid style? That's a great question. So as of right now, my understanding is that we don't have the technology to have a um, um, live discussion with the community. So if community members would like to make a comment, they'll come down to the meeting and then have the opportunity there, but they'll be um, recorded and available for, so for people to watch, the, the people that are watching just won't be uh, able to comment or communicate right. with us. Right? Just like they used to be when they were broadcast. Correct. Tony, same. Okay. That's great. As long as they were broadcast like they used to be, I think that that's, that's lovely. And just as always, people are welcome to come and encouraged to come. And then the meetings are always recorded and um, we updated everything because the way they were being recorded before, they weren't automatically being uploaded onto the town website, but um, we've gone back and um, all of the old uh, but so previous meetings are available on the town website and um, last week and, and this week, they're going to be available, you know, basically as soon as the meeting is over, they're available on the town website for people to reference if they missed the meeting and wanted to watch our, you know, exciting meeting <laughs> in their spare time. <laughs> so, um, 
So I think this is something we would vote upon um, because it'll be a change of our practice. I'd be happy to take a motion to move our meetings to in-person, starting with our next uh, meeting, which is the uh, February 15th. I would like to, I would love to make a motion to move our meetings to in-person meetings, beginning with the meeting scheduled for February 15th of 2022. All in favor? Uh, Ms. Sherlock, Ms. Dan, Ms. Garris, and myself, motion carries. Any other business from the committee? Madam Chair, if I may be so bold. I apologize for this, but I do want to remind them, uh, members of the committee, that I sent you the preschool tuition rates earlier today. My assumption is, I didn't hear from anyone, but my assumption is that those rates, which we just established for the current year, are still good so that we can send the preschool packets out? Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to verify that. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Locke? The only um, other thing that I wanted to bring up is that we received notification from um, Town Hall that you know um, anyone who's up for re-election this year needs to submit nomination packets, uh, signed papers are due back by 4 p.m. on March 9th, um, and our terms are to, uh, they're three-year terms if you're up for re-election. Um, I know in the pa past year or so, we've had partial terms that people have been filling for people who have departed. So it became a little confusing. We had a one-year term or two-year term. You know, it's, it's been a little fragmented, um, but um, they're three-year terms. And um, this year, um, I believe that we'll have at least one seat um, vacant because um, after serving for several years now, I, which has been my honor and privilege, um, I am at this time not intending to run again this spring, uh, and it's been it's been such a great experience, and I really really have appreciated it and felt very honored to do so. And I'd strongly encourage anyone in the committee in the uh, community who's interested, whether a parent or guardian or just not community member, to you know strongly consider joining this committee. It's such a wonderful group, and it's a great great endeavor to be a part of. Um, so if anyone has any questions about it, I'd also encourage people to reach out to me. My email is on the um, town website. I'd be happy to chit chat. I'm frequently found around town. And, um, I'd be happy to talk, um, but, uh, but thank you all. And I just wanted to bring that up. Well, thank you for all your work, Lauren. I know it's been the past couple of years, you know, has, have been difficult and, you know, I just, personally appreciated you being on the committee. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. It's been a complete pleasure, but, um, and it's very, actually, it's very emotional to say that I won't be running this. I really, really do love it. And I'm not just saying that, I really do. So I really love all of, all of you. I love the school. I love everything about it. It's just a matter of, um, you know, serving time in different, different commitments and um number of years and on all that good stuff but it's all wonderful and maybe i'd run again someday if the community were kind enough to elect me so <laughs> that's it Lauren, for everything. we're so grateful and we'll spread the word and um you know share with other people that you might that might be interested in the committee but we understand any other business from the committee um, so seeing no other uh, comments, uh, I'd like to take a motion to adjourn. And uh, we'll adjourn to executive session, not to reconvene to open session. I'll make a motion at 8.38 p.m. to adjourn this session to reconvene into executive session. Um, I just messed it up, didn't I? <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> Not to reconvene to to adjourn to executive session and not to uh, reconvene to open session. Okay, to adjourn to executive session, not to reconvene to open session. And we should mention that the reason for executive session is to approve the executive session minutes from December fourteenth, 
and to conduct the strategy session in preparation for negotiations with union personnel. We could just make note in the minutes. Can I have a second? Yeah. I'll second them. All in favor of returning? At 8.39. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thanks. Good night, Kevin. Um, Tony, before I forget, right after I said that about Juneteenth, I was looking at the packet and, and um, in the packet, it says that Juneteenth would be recognized on Sunday. So I feel like it's, I mean, all federal holidays that occur on a weekend have a weekday, you know, that, that the holidays observe, but in the, in the um, information that you sent in our package, which is, I'm just scrolling to the right day. Um, it's page, I don't even know how I can tell which page it is. Uh, 25. Uh, from the Department of Elementary and Se Secondary Education for the 2021 to 2022 school year. It says Juneteenth is Sunday, June 19th. That's how, the, that's how it's listed federally too. It's not listed as observed on the next day. It's listed, I don't know how that works. I feel like it's really important for us to figure that out because I mean, I guess it's really important once we have enough snow days that it would come past the weekend. So we have at least one more snow day. And then if we go beyond one more, so we have, we're currently ending on a Thursday, but I just wanted to point that out. It wouldn't automatically, I don't think it would automatically push us into the Tuesday. According to MSN, they say that um, Juneteenth will be recognized on June 20th. Because there, there I was, have, when I, when I Google it search it, that it would be recognized on the 20th, but it's not in this DSE guidelines. So yeah. I don't know. Is that a negotiated day for a holiday? I know for for us it wasn't. It was automatic, and it is a third. Because it's a federal holiday, I think it's I think, automatic. Yeah, I don't think we have a choice. Is that right? I think it's automatic too. Yeah, that would. That's it's what, interesting that the document is from the DSE. Yeah, I, I think that we would have to honor I it. I do too. I think that we do too. I just wanted to point it out. Lauren, can I ask you again for the date that you said about filing for the school committee? I missed. Uh, yes, it's due, all signed papers are due back to Diane by 4 p.m. on March 9th. Okay, so Madam Chair, uh, I'm looking at this. So the calendar in front of you is for the 2022-23 school year and June 19th. No, Juneteenth I'm, I'm, isn't on it at all, which is a mistake. Right, then, right. Because if we don't go past that day, it's a moot point. And it's during the summer. It's during the summer holiday. I right. was actually, I was referring to our current year that we're in, which is um, just because it's more time sensitive. Um, we're currently, our, our, the 15th is the last day of school with no snow days. We had one snow day, so we're scheduled to end on the 16th. If we have another snow day, we can end on the 17th. But if we have two more snow days, we would end on the 20th, which I think is Juneteenth observed. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm like, I, it's got to be the case. So. so then we would be, you were absolutely right before, 21st. then we would be on Tuesday the 21st. Yeah. Yeah. Great day, great day for a holiday, June 19th. I know. I know you have a long weekend and then one more day of school. I can't imagine how many kids will not be in school that day. Okay, but- And actually, I, I didn't even think about it. I didn't even think about it. I was looking at camp schedules for my kids and the camp I was looking at for that first week is Tuesday to Friday. And I was like, oh, that's so weird that they're starting on Tuesday and now it makes sense because Monday is a holiday. But- the same, the, the exact same thing would happen next year. Next year, yeah, because the holiday is actually on a Monday. Next on a Monday, year. it's exactly yeah. the same thing. So yeah. do you so, want me to somehow no. note that? No? no? Okay. No, we'll just, I just feel like it's worth, I don't think it 
need, I don't know, do you think it needs to be noted on the actual school calendar so that, especially because it's new and parents might not be aware? Yeah, maybe, let me, let me. Yeah, maybe let me, on the next school cal calendar, we should indicate, because it says with five snow days, we would end on the 22nd. That's actually not true. With five snow days, we would end on the 23rd. That's mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. Let me let me figure out how to say it. Maybe maybe in the last block, I would just simply put a note that said uh, Juneteenth, Monday, June nineteenth. There there will be no school. Regardless. Regardless, so you know, blah blah blah. I think, good, I think a good way to notate it would be in that last box how it says on last day of school, um, with five closing days. It would actually, oh, is that the 23rd? So is that right? Is that taken into account Juneteenth? Did you already do that for the I, for the Flatland school year? You know, you know, I, I think I did, but let me double ch check it. So you have you did, yep. Because the 15th is a Thursday and five snow days will be the Friday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's already Thursday, taken into Thursday. consideration. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We so did talk maybe, about it last maybe, time. But, yeah. but maybe include 180 school days, including, you know, five school closing days. And this takes into account Juneteenth, which there would be no school or something like that. But yeah. Yeah, in that, in that parenthesis, in the bottom, it could say 185 days, including five school closing days, comma, no school on June 9th, uh, whatever. No school on June 19th. Yeah. Um, can I ask a random question about the calendar then? What happens um, with the negotiated days with the staff if it goes past five snow days? You know what I mean? Like what if like a couple of years ago where there was so many snow days? Yeah, like, what generally happens is there's a uh, impact bargaining or the commissioner says, forget the last few days, or he or he or she doesn't. Oh. Uh, but the, you know, the contract is the contract. It calls for 180 days of school, 183 days of work. And um, if typically speaking, as long as the days are prior to June 30th, they don't make a big deal about it. Yeah, okay. Mason was yeah. at school when when that big snow year happened, so I yeah. had no. Idea. I will. He was in preschool still, so I never have experienced more than five snow days. And my last day in summer, my last uh, day in Somerville was June thirtieth, two thousand fifteen, a school day. <laughs> uh, Gina, you know you're still recording. Oh shoot! Thanks. Yeah.